So good evening to everybody who is joining us and welcome to the Labyrinth Books live stream featuring professors Elena Frato of Princeton University, Harriet Murov of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and Jacob Emery of Indiana University Bloomington here to discuss Professor Frato's book, Medical Story Worlds, Health, Illness, and Bodies in Russian and European Literature at the turn of the 20th century. My name is Matt and I will be your host for this evening. And before we dive into what promises to be a lively discussion, I have just a few items to call to your attention. This event comes toward the top of a roster of events that Labyrinth Books is hosting for the upcoming spring season. We have a great lineup and I encourage you to browse the upcoming events under the events tab that you'll see at the top of the page on labyrinthbooks.com. And at labyrinthbooks.com, you can also order your own copy of Medical Story Worlds for 10% off. Just make sure that you enter the word FRATO, that's F-R-A-T-T-O, as the discount code at checkout to receive that discount. Or of course, you can always come by the store in person in Princeton, New Jersey and pick up your copy that way. I'd also like to uh, take a second to just thank both the Humanities Council and the Department for Slavic Languages at Princeton University for their co-sponsorship of this event. This event will also feature a, a Q&A portion towards the end of this hour, uh, around 6.50 or so, and uh, there will be an opportunity for any of the observers of this webinar to ask a question of the professors. And if you ever come up with a question at any point in the panel, go ahead and throw that into the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen or in the chat. Uh, no need to hold on to that until later. Anytime you have a question, feel free to use that feature. So for tonight, we are thrilled to feature Professor Elena Frato and her colleagues across institutions. Professor Frato is the co-editor of Russian Literature of the Anthropocene and has also published on Boris Eichenbaum, on formalist fiction and the visual arts, and also on post-Soviet kitsch aesthetics. Joining her in conversation, as I just mentioned, is Professor Harriet Murov of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Her published works include the books Holy Foolishness, Dostoevsky's novels, and The Poetics of Cultural Critique, Russia's legal fictions, and also David Bergelson's Strange New World, Untimeliness and Futurity. She won the John Simon Guggenheim Award as well for her book, Music on a Speeding Train, Russian, Jewish, and Soviet Yiddish uh, Literature of the 20th Century. Rounding out our panel for this evening is Professor of Slavic and East European Languages and Culture, Jacob Emery from Indiana University, Bloomington. Jacob Emery just published a novel titled A Clockwork River in October of 2021, which has been called Exuberant and a monumental hydropunk novel that promises to make waves in the realms of science fiction and fantasy. He's also written uh, for the nonfiction side of things, Alternative Kinships, Economy and Family in Russian Modernism for the NIU series in Slavic, East European and Eurasian Studies. So we are sure to be in for a dynamic and thought provoking discussion of Elena Frato's wonderful book in which she turns her attention and ours to the time around the turn of the 20th century when many medical practices and institutions as we know them were taking shape. The narrative aspect of the medical profession and the place of storytelling in the experience of patients can have a profound impact on individuals as well as on society at large. So how do the authors that Professor Frato reads so closely flip the standardized and generalized narratives around via subversive literary texts that return this agency back to individuals and to patients in particular. And the pandemic has only made the many questions raised and answered in this absorbing book feel more urgent for our time. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our distinguished guests to this virtual platform.
Well, thank you, Max. Thank you, Dorothea. Thank you, Labyrinth Box. And I will also want to reiterate my thanks to the Humanities Council at Princeton and to my department, the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures. And of course, thank you very much, Harriet and Jacob, for participating. Um, just wanted to say a couple of things, uh, a couple of words uh, about how this book came about. Um, I guess I stumbled upon the interpretive nature of medicine when I moved to the US so 12 years ago, and I was met by a very different healthcare system uh, compared to the one I was used to here in Europe. So in order to understand it and parse it, I used uh, my toolbox as a literary scholar. I'm an enthusiast of uh, theories of narrative, of storytelling. Therefore, I was trying to map my categories, my definitions like authorship, text, readership, uh, agency onto uh, this territory. Um, this book rests upon the assumption that uh, although medicine relies upon hard sciences such as biochemistry or physiology, medicine itself uh, entails uh, quite a bit of an interpretive endeavor. Um, and in so many uh, medical purviews, we can detect um, like an inherent narrative structure. For example, in the way medical knowledge itself is formulated or transmitted in, med in medical protocols or procedures in the reasons why um, research, medical research is furthered or is even funded or um, in the goals that public health officials um, hand in hand with, with legislators set for their societies. And so um, this book tries to speak to um, modern day pressing debates in the medical humanities, such as um, end of life, um, long course treatment with uh, an uncertain outcome, uh, medical rhetoric, um, but also the non-human within the human. Uh, by making, by putting in conversation um, texts that were produced a hundred years ago, more or less, with um, modern day uh, procedures. So I find uh, structural similarities between the way texts are produced, uh, transmitted or received, and uh, the field of medicine works. Um, and, I, and I make this otherwise dusty canonical books uh, speak to uh, and contribute to um, current debates in the medical humanities. And by the same token, uh, I'm hoping that this new medical humanities avenue for which I look um, at this, uh, this box um, will um, tease out new, new facets of, of books that we know very well. Uh, so that's how it all started. I wanted, to, um, I wanted to address earlier iterations of today's debates. I'm not arguing for points of origins or for any teleology. Uh, so based on the structural similarity between medical procedures and medical knowledge and uh, storytelling, the storytelling endeavor, uh, I make these two otherwise very distant um, universes <laughs> speak to each other. Uh, of course, uh, Russian authors or Italian and French authors that I analyze are reacting to their own, uh, their own environment, the way medical uh, knowledge and medicine as a science was rapidly evolving. Uh, so of course, our debates were <laughs> outside of the cultural horizon uh, at that time. However, um, since the medical humanities are still a predominantly Anglophone, uh, field, it was important for me to bring in new voices that contribute with, with the rest in force uh, to debates we, we entertain today. Um, so yes, this is how it came about. And then, of course, while I was writing the conclusions, um, the, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic hit. And that brought everything full circle because I could really uh, bring home so many concepts and associations and similarities that I had drawn throughout the book um, to, to the present, to the here and now. Um, so that uh, precipitated like an afterword uh, that um, my writing this afterward that closed, kept off the book in a way that is more, um, more urgent and, and, and 
and situated in time and place and less abstract uh, than just, you know, an academic conversation on literature and medicine. Well, I think I'm supposed to ask you <laughs> the first question. I just feel a little awkward. Thank you for that really compelling and very, very succinct description of, of a complex book that deals with many different authors and really many different life worlds, not only story worlds, but, but life worlds. Different, the 1920s is dramatically different from the 1870s. And yet this is a, such a elegant, and, sl and slender volume um, uh, for re reader friendly for that and many other reasons. Um, okay. I, I have a, a kind of a general question and you can answer it from you know, any, any perspective you like. And, and that is when I was reading the part of the book about Masha Geshen's um, sort of blog about her, her genetic problem and the, necess the recourse that she was considering, which Angelina Jolie did, the double mastectomy and so forth. And in the context of, of COVID and ever-changing streams of information, it seems to me that the story world that we're in and that we've inherited, especially from figures like Tolstoy um, in his later phase, is a state of alert. It's a constant state of alert. This might go wrong. This could happen. I could have this. Um, I could be dying of that. I could have a deficiency of this. I mean, has this particular cast of storytelling, this kind of orientation towards catastrophe, um, made us um, insensitive and unable to experience what I want to call like the contingency of joy? Wow. Um, well, contingency is there. And, and that's a great question because we are doing, you know, we are in this constant exercise of living in the present. Um, and that might uh, harm our, our uh, capacity to, to, to enjoy it. And, and because we, we look at the present from this vantage point of an imagined future or rather feared future. Uh, so we look at ourselves now from our future selves. So it's a mediated look upon what we're doing now. And we think we might go wrong in you know, one way or another. Uh, and, and so the temporality that this operation entails is very complex and, and, and fits very well this era of, of serialized <laughs> narratives and everybody watches, watches a series on TV or back in the 19th century, everybody was reading serialized novels so um there's this um not a definite but a provisional um balance uh, that we we reach and then we're still thrown into into um a situation of, of uncertainty that uh probably yes um impairs us uh, in in enjoying the, <laughs> the contingency of joy and, and the moment or many of us at least so I want to follow up. With, I want to kind of blame Tolstoy a little more, okay? Because in in War and Peace, you know, if your dress fits perfectly and you're having a good hair day, it can make you very very happy, and it does, right? It makes Natasha Rostov extremely happy that the dress fits just the way it was meant to for the ball. But by the time we get to the death of Ivan Yelich. A dress that fits well is, is a moral failing, and it's not an occasion for joy. And have we inherited the wrong Tolstoy? Have we inherited the wrong story? There are many Tolstoys. He was a complex character, as we, as we know. Uh, just look at his attitude towards medicine and doctors. You know, officially, he uh, was very critical of, of modern medicine, but then, of course, he wanted a doctor attached permanently to, to Yasna and Paliana. So there are many tall stories um, that you know, we, we, we encounter and we deal with. Um, he, for one, he was very afraid of death, as we know, uh, of dying. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see that the way he developed and, and perfected uh, his mastery over narrative time sprang out of his own fear of, of death and his uh, need to control the passing of time 
uh, by by managing the expectations of the reader. So uh, it is a very complex author. Uh, the, uh, he is a very complex author. There are many, many sides to him. Uh, so I wouldn't say we inherited one <laughs> or another. I think there's a little bit of everything. Um, there's the reflection upon end of life that he brings about in Ivan Ilyich, where death really casts this retrospective ordering glance uh, over, over uh, all the events of life. But then there's Anna Karenina with, with this, you know, stumbling. There's an ending in sight, but, and yet there's another one and, and something that develops as he writes. Um, and that reflects very much the situation, you know, the situation we're in, uh, for example, with the pandemic today, you know, the, the the, the, the authorities and the, the medical authorities um, are a step or two uh, ahead of us in understanding what's going on. But then, of course, uh, they update their knowledge as, they, as we go, just like um, Tolstoy did as, as he wrote Anna Karenina. Um, and, you know, he added a whole eighth part uh, that was not expected to be there. Uh, so that Tolstoy, that, that uh, facet of Tolstoy, speaks to us now, but maybe, you know, other facets of him uh, speak to us in different historical or cultural uh, moments. I, I often think regarding Tolstoy and the persistence of the medical theme in his work about the fact that his career as a writer began in some sense in the venereal disease clinic in Kazan, where he was committed uh, when he was first uh, infected with, with gonorrhea. And then he sits down and he, and he says, I need to live my life differently. I need to, to live according to these Rousseauan principles and I need to start writing regularly. And so, so the project of his diaries and his later career as a novelist in some ways grows out of this early brush with disease. And and it struck me reading your book, and in particular the the chapter on Anna Karenina that describes uh, sort of death as this final closure and the quest for some kind of closure that will uh, put a period to the to the end of of the narrative. That maybe um, Tolstoy's own recurrent spiritual crises and his uh, his recurrent thoughts of of suicide and efforts to bring a close to his own life um, are, are connected in a in a narratological sense. Um, I, I was struck too, and I want to connect this to the second chapter in which you talk about um, the play Knock, and, and it, 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 this I found in some ways the most intriguing insight in the book is this, this idea that the medical establishment looks on the patient as a kind of unreliable narrator Whose, whose body presents a set of symptoms that, that may or may not be uh, accurately interpreted by the, by the patient themselves and becomes a text that has to be tied down and given a specific treatment by a medical reader who uh, is able to approach the text in a different way. And the institutional tug of war between the, the body of the patient and the patient who claims to read in one way, and then the doctors who claim to read the text in another way, um, really, really uh, was compelling to me. And I, um, and I wanted to ask about uh, the theme of closure as you describe it in the first chapter, which has to do with Anna Karenina and death and, and the narrative role of the ending as the story unfolds towards death. Um, if you could put that into uh, dialogue a little bit with the second chapter of the book, in which you talk about unreliability and the impossibility of closure and, and the idea that uh, diagnoses are themselves institutionally interested phenomena that might be reflecting financial interests or medical prejudices on the one hand, hypochondria and false interpretations of symptoms on the other. Where, where does closure come from when you bring those two chapters into dialogue? Yes, so the I would say perspective is a good way to look at these two chapters together, three chapters, one with death and the postmortem, chapter two with this uh, receding ending, and chapter three with this um, what was medical rhetoric. Because in chapter one, when the body's dead, the, the surgeon or the, the physician is the sole author, uh, the, the sole reader of, of, of signs and writer about, about the signs, you know, he or she who superimposes a plot over that, uh, those symptoms and those signs. Um, in chapter uh, two, we see 
characters. Uh, so Anna Karenina, for example, or, or Masha Gessen as a character, because she's the author and the hero of all her story, uh, as well as readers build expectations and, and write this, what they call a virtual plot in narrative theory. So this mix of, of remembered pasts and imagined futures that updates uh, at every bit of information we get from reading or from <laughs> diagnostic uh, results if you're a patient uh, who's on a long course treatment. And then you have the author uh, or the oncologist you know, managing the readers or the patient's expectations. So authorship is more complex here, but it gets even more complex in chapter three where you have a narrative that is the product of the few that gets refracted and, and um, diffused and becomes the, the speech of the many. So at that point, you don't know anymore uh, the origin, who's the original author of what has been repeated from all directions and, and, uh, and pushed and, and, and um, celebrated. So that's, I, I would say that's the main twist um, when we think about um, closed or open narratives uh, between the, those chapters. If it's okay, I want to I want to come to the question of close and open from a perspective of a different author who is mentioned, but you don't really engage. You know, my old friend Dostoevsky. So, so way I got interested in the medical profession is and their discourse and their narratives as opposed to more traditional approaches to certain kinds of illness. I, I mean, holy foolishness. My first book. I would, I, the, 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 the catalyst was the last word of BSC, where the medical, the, after the postmortem, they say that Steph Rogan was not insane. I think it's the, like the last, the very last word. And I'm like, wait, what? You know, they just did an autopsy in, in his brain and they saw that there were no lesions. So they said, oh, not insane. And that just takes you right back to the beginning of the book and you you don't know what to think and it, it's kind of like a mise en abeam of ironies and I'm wondering if Dostoevsky didn't become like a player in your cast of characters because of the greater I don't know wildness of his narratives their greater uh, sort of open-endedness or shock or shagginess you know go back to that that mm -hmm. old scandal of Russian literature, the loose shaggy, baggy shaggy mo monster. I mean, there are plenty of medical case histories in, in, in and Dostoevsky himself is, is a case history. So can you, right. can you speak about the other half of Tolstoyevsky? <laughs> of course. Uh, yeah. Well, I have uh, Bratya Karamazov in my first chapter yes. when That's I true. talk about endings and well, and how, the structure of the skull that, that Dr. C uh, reveals the configuration of the skull, and therefore, you know, social behavior and, and whatnot. Um, but um, I made a point not to address mental health. I mean, of course, it's still reductive to say, uh, to say mental health when we <laughs> talk about the CSA yeah. character that is so complex there, but um, I didn't want to address um, psychiatry or psychology too much because it is the most obvious connection when we think about literature and medicine. You know, so, so much has been written in, in that in, in that vein. You know, to to, to examine um, neurology, psychiatry, neurodiversity. Of course, uh, uh, my point was to uh, to show how all medicine shows this this inherent uh, narrative structure. Not only um, psychology, psychi psychiatry. You know, the most obvious. Uh, parts of medicine. Um, also, um, you know, of course, Freud is not there, but because it all, uh, um, psychoanalysis only only takes off in Russia in the 20s, quite a bit, a bit later, uh, two two decades later than the rest of Europe. Um, so it's it's not it's not there. So that's why I left it. Um, you know, I left that side a bit muted. Although, of course, I bring in Dostoevsky when I talk about endings and closures uh, with with. Uh, with Mishkin and, and the, the, the death sentence uh, recollections. 
uh, because of course, of course, the Seski himself didn't know uh, how to end crime and punishment when he was writing it. Um, in some in some drafts, uh, Raskolnikov commits suicide. So again, um, as a formalist would say, the material determines itself, as as you're right. So you might have an, an, a plan in the beginning, but then you're you're you're, co you're committed to the page. So what you're writing leads you somewhere. Um, so you know, here's to to open uh, open endedness. But that's the main reason why Dostoevsky mm. is not as present as as Tolstoy. In, in the book. He's there, but not as, as uh, prominently. Another writer that's a household name from Russian literature that comes up, but doesn't get a chapter devoted to him is, is Chekhov, who's, who's remarkable because he was a doctor. And I, and I yes. noted that in the discussion of Bulgakov, who's also a medically trained doctor, mm -hmm. um, you, you discuss the text uh, and don't dwell particularly on his second profession. As, as a doctor, and I, and I think about these people who went through lengthy training that involved interacting with bodies and writing medical case histories while they were in school and, and, and in a history of, of diagnostic practice and, uh, and, and, and wondered um, well, why you chose not to stress that particularly. And, uh, and, and then also um, whether you think their medical training might have made them better or worse refractors of medical discourse than people who you know, came to it as laymen. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I didn't want to write a history um, of Russian literature and medicine. Uh, my work is more theoretical. I mean, Chekhov is there, of course, it, he doesn't have a specific uh, chapter devoted to him, but uh, well, Palata Numer uh, War Number Six, and and um, Sucha is Praktiki. I'm blanking on the English name. Uh, what's what's that in English? Um, I think it's a doctor's visit. Yes, are there? Um, also, um, I didn't want to to provide a gallery of portraits, you know, of of uh, physician authors. I could have. It would have been a beautiful book, but a different book. I was more interested in in showing structural similarities in the way you know um, an author or a character decides to tell a story to own to possess uh, the, the story to turn the, the official narratives up, uh, up on their heads and and what and some phenomena that that surround us today so the similarities structural similarities between the two uh, my book has two foci and moves <laughs> between them rather than um, embarking on a historical examination of uh, phys physician author figures um, in Russia. But that would have been a very nice book too. Uh, Williams, Carlos Williams loved Chekhov. Mm. Uh, so all, you know, he, he nurtured generations of, of uh, physicians and physician writers uh, all over the world with his stories. Is there time for another one more question from each of us, or am I taking up too much time? It's okay. Oh, no, Plenty yeah. of time. Go okay. ahead. Yes, thank, yes. thank you. So this is kind of a, me a messy question. Um, sometimes it seems to me that what controls the narrative of our medical story world is is money. It, it is nothing to do with the structure of stories. It has to do with what insurance will pay. Um, and this is why we don't have permission any longer to say that the pain is burning. We have to say on a scale of one to 10 that the pain is a seven. And if we go to a physical therapist, we have to say at the end, the pain is now down to a three, although it could have changed form. So, I mean, I'm wondering if there's a way that literature um, expresses, interrogates, understands, theorizes these intangibles that are a part of that medical practice tries to address in a way that is outside of story-ness per se. And I have in mind, you know, this essay by Manuel Levinas called Useless Suffering, um, one of my most favorite and only really comprehensible Levinas that I've ever read in which he <laughs> says that pain is a scandal. 
it scandalizes the theodicy, and, and, and you could extend that to say it scandalizes any teleological narrative because it just doesn't end and it, and it thwarts efforts to control it. And I, I'm wondering if that kind of reflection makes any sense to you in context of the book or if there are parts of the chapters that I'm just not remembering clearly in which you kind of, you make gestures towards this other dimension. Of course, um, well, pain is, is a popular topic. Uh, before the COVID-19 epidemic, you know, the, the big opioid epidemic was the biggest one and it's uh, still there. So people have been talking about pain more than they used to. Um, and, you know, I think it all begins from uh, the, the trope of the wounded storyteller. So there's the wound, there's uh, pain that makes somebody speak and tell a story. And there's existential pain, physical pain. Um, I always bring up uh, this, uh, this tragedy by Sophocles called Philoctetes. That is, um, I, I, yeah, it's, it's also in the book. Um, this is the first uh, iteration of onomatopoeia to express pain. You know, um, Elaine Scarry has a great book on pain uh, called The Body in Pain. And she argues that um, pain cannot be communicated. No way. So there's an ontological gap between those uh, who suffer and those who surround them. Um, and that's why uh, the medical establishment has come up with, with pain scales and, and ways to, to quantify or metaphors in a burning pain, itching pain, stabbing pain. Um, and yet you have, you have uh, onomatopoeia in literature. So no words, like you know, breaking down um, words to, to their most, to the littlest, uh, smallest components, just like pain breaks everything apart. And that onomatopoeia pierces through, you know, we, we get it. Uh, when when Philoctetes, the, the protagonist, is wounded, but also um, betrayed by his best friend, uh, he, he screams in, in pain, which is existential, physical, uh, all of it, and goes, you know, in, in, in the Greek uh, way to, 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 to write about this, it's pa, 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 instead of out. And yet we get it um, because we we have uh, experienced that you know one way or another, and that goes beyond all you know storytelling techniques and you know uh, perspective, time, space. Uh, it gets right at you. Uh, so that's one way uh, in which you know literature goes around all these. And formal, elegant uh, devices that we can use. Although, as you say, uh, mm, rhetoric is very uh, medical rhetoric uh, is very complex, and for sure, insurance companies, just like religious authorities, legislators, patients, doctors, caregivers, they all claim authorship and authority over matters of, of illness, be it individual or collective. So they all have their stance and, and it is a very complex uh, choreography and constellation of actors, of agents, uh, including non-human agents that have a say and tell a story. Um, and that's what really uh, drew me to, to, to map this, this complex field with, uh, you know, with um, ideas and, and definitions that we normally apply to the production um, and, and uh, distribution or reception of, of, of literary texts. So uh, authorship and agencies, uh, certainly agency is the first one because when you make a story your own, a story that people have been telling about you and you <laughs> claim authorship upon it and by, by running against, rubbing against the grain, then this is an act of, of, of response, uh, post-colonial a post-colonial gesture um, almost uh, of a body or a person has been colonized by, by medicine uh, and, and its language and its tools and its molecules uh, with, with, with the pharmaceuticals and decides to, to, to tell a story. Um, so as, as, as you know, demilitarized zone <laughs> that, that comes back at you, the body writes back in a way. I guess I'll close off with a 
a very general question, and in a way, the response that you just gave to Harriet's question was um, was an example of, of what I mean, in that you you pass very deftly between Philoctetes and the contemporary insurance industry, and uh, the, the 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 gap between those life worlds, as Harriet put it earlier, is uh, is is tremendous, and um, and it's typical, I think, of the of the deft and fluid way in which you are talking about. Russian literature, but you're also making perpetual reference to medieval and ancient culture and introducing examples of advertisements for prophylactic screenings and things like that. And so the, the, the temporal range is, is enormous. And I wanted to ask you, what makes, um, in your view, this uh, turn of the 20th century in Russia and European literature, as you say, what makes that um, a, a, a privileged temporal moment to put into contact the ancient traditions and the contemporary medical practices, often from the West that you're, uh, that you're describing in the book. Uh, so much is um, unfolding, uh, so much is happening in the field of medicine at the end of the 19th century, um, germ theory and you know, all. Um, battlefield medicine and and oh, like so many like epochal um, discoveries and then in, in Russia the professionalization of, of, of doctors while well, the reforms of course in the 60s and so, so many things are are changing and rapidly uh, that authors respond to what is around them uh, in in with, with very strong opinions with very strong statements uh, so, so there's a density of medical themes that are um, that, that spring up out of a response um, or, or a critique most most often to what is happening around the authors um, that makes that time and that uh, and that place um, you know quite quite uh, um, quite fertile for for my investigation. Uh, Russia lags behind in the beginning, uh, but then, by 1897, uh, there's already the first um, international um, uh, um, conference on psychiatry um, in Moscow. So, you know, with, with the reforms, with the Ziemstva, uh, it really, really catches up. And then germ theory, of course, brings, uh, confers an agency upon the physicians. You know, they actually, they fight a germ. It's not that they just bureaucrats in, in the provinces. So um, the way uh, medicine is also considered and looked at is different, um, professionalization, um, journals are born, uh, but also the battlefield that really, you know, within, with the chemical industry that really brings together war, agriculture and, and, and medicine. Sometimes it's the same molecule that is used for, for all three. Um, and and so, so this uh, really makes medicine a privileged, um, a privileged field for, for um, expressing like broader existential questions, like determinism, you know, all, all that you know, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, for example, bring up, um, and that are very much in dialogue with today's um, debates about nature and nurture. On you know, what is that nature or nurture, or both that that determine um, you know, behavioral syndromes or disorders or syndromes, or so. So there are very deep. Um, uh, reflections and very incisive statements that are still speaking to us today. Uh, you know, from from a century ago, they are coming to us. And even though, of, of course, as I said before, they were not meant <laughs> to 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 talk to these specific debates, but they do. And I believe that other voices from other areas of the world should be added too, because as I said before. Uh, medical humanities are still overwhelmingly anglophone in, in scope, and, and uh, I'm sure that more, uh, and I hope that more uh, traditions will be brought into conversation. And, you know, in, in Slavic languages and literatures, we have so much to, to bring to the table uh, that, uh, you know, that is probably even more than what I, I I scratched the surface here and I, I, I chose some specific case studies, but so much more can be brought in. It's such a fertile epoch, such a fertile uh, area for that. Uh, 
Oh, there's a, I see a question from Dorothea. Mm -hmm. Uh, she's asking, um, should I read it aloud? Does everybody... Yeah, go for it. Yes. <laughs> okay. So Dorothea asks, given the origin of your project and your encounter with the U.S. medical establishment, where do you see differences in European versus U.S. practices regarding the patient's agency or her authorship of her own story? Um, so I can give a couple of examples. Um, for, well, the first one is an anecdote. Um, so back, uh, back home, I used to have a primary care physician. Uh, well, there are so many differences. So we'll, also the way the education is structured. So we get our liberal arts education in high school. So my, my primary care physician and I could speak about Greek tragedy, although she knew biochemistry and I couldn't, and I didn't. So that, you know, then we specialize in different things, but there's a common pool of references that, that we, can, we can talk about. And in the US, I saw like a gap with probably historians of science or anthropologists of science being this nice cushioning middle that could bring uh, medical doctors and literary scholars in, in a dialogue. Um, so once I sprained my ankle, I was living in the Boston area during my PhD and I went to see my like a doctor twice in the same day. But before you see the doctor, you see the nurse who takes your vitals and anthrop anthropometric. Uh, um, measurements and that day my height was measured twice and I thought you know I, and that's where I, I, I understood there was no big picture it was you know like a random uh, array of, of measurements because I, I told them that I'm, I was fairly certain that my height hadn't changed from morning <laughs> to, to afternoon but it was completely random there was no um, there was no one um, actor who had the whole picture. And also, um, you know, I, I, I appreciate the, um, the possibility to, to go and find the specialist I prefer in the US medical system, you know, it's all um, free. In my country, my primary care physician would refer me to a specialist and I would have to bring back <laughs> the, you know, the diagnosis. So my doctor kept, all the strands of my medical history together um, just like me only she and I had the whole <laughs> the whole picture and instead in the US I find my, I found myself repeating the story multiple times to different you know segments <laughs> of this clinical picture you know one nurse then one doctor then one specialist and it was a bit Kafkian and certainly a disorienting experience although of course there are there are pros and cons in each in each system but that you know from a narrative point of view that's the that's the, the main difference and then in terms of agency that's a great question um i thought about agency when uh i was expecting my baby in the us and uh, I was treated as, as a patient instead of just a pregnant woman. <laughs> it's not a disease, <laughs> but it was very medicalized. And, and so, of course, I fell into statistics and uh, they told me that just by my age and race and, and whatnot, then I had to be on a certain medication, even if they didn't even <laughs> look at me and, and, and establish whether I really needed that. So I felt... Deep, sometimes I felt deprived of agency. Then I decided to work with midwives. <laughs> it was much better. Uh, but but um, I, I felt a lack of agency there. Um, but I, yeah, I think, um, I think in terms of, of, of storytelling, and so, so that lack of unity, of a unifying, unifying frame was what really prompted me to look uh, further, to look deeper, to look closer and try to make sense of this new environment I, I was in. I went to informa information sessions about the healthcare system with other PhD students from Europe uh, back in, 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 at Harvard. Um, you know, the, the doctor would explain and then three of us would always stay <laughs> because we had so many questions and she would ask, oh, you're Europeans. So we didn't know what co-payment was, what uh, it was all very new and we felt very lost. <laughs> Uh, but you know, over time, over time, we learned, and again, there are pros and cons of each of each system. Mm -hmm. But that's interesting about um, 
having to keep coming back to the same story over and over can certainly, whether that's intentional or not about having this decentralized uh, 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 wheel of uh, system of information, it can sort of lead you to feelings of going in circles, basically, even if that's not necessarily any medical professional's intent, but that's a great mm -hmm. answer. Thank you. Um, there aren't any other uh, open questions right now. I would encourage uh, anybody who's watching um, to continue chewing things over and think about uh, all of the um, interesting insights that have been provided so far. And while you all are thinking about that, I'll have uh, one question here that I'd like to pose. Um, I'm wondering, uh, uh, after this uh, incredibly rich uh, and nuanced dive in turn of the century literature, if we were to look towards uh, literary fiction today, and, and I do mean uh, fiction because you do talk a little bit about Masha Gessen and um, the blog post that Masha was creating as um, Masha was exploring the double mastectomy option. Um, if we look at fiction today, are you noticing any way that um, what's being written and published today is in some way picking up the torch that um, Tol uh, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and the other authors in your book that you analyze have sort of um, used to uh, throw a different perspective or subvert uh, the lit the medical rhetoric and the medical establishment that overgeneralizes is the literature of today uh, sort of picking up that thread, or has it pivoted in a way that's uh, different or unexpected? Even wow, that's a great question because there's so much that's been produced. Um, well, recently uh, on caregiving, for example, this is the time of chronic ailments. I mean, we, we have abandoned the idea of the doctor who fixes a body that doesn't work. Um, the vast majority of medical care is devoted to chronic illnesses or, or long-term illnesses or autoimmune diseases. So uh, there's a lot about caregiving, um, especially in graphic novels. Uh, there's one I really like, it's called Epileptic. I mean, there, there are so many. Uh, and you have a, the perspective of the caregiver that um, is, sometimes slightly, sometimes very different from, from the ones that the doctor would, would provide. Uh, then there's a lot about um, the non-human. So recently, Claire and the Sun by, by uh, Ishiguro mm -hmm. is, is one about caregiving, but with, with AI <laughs> in. Um, so caregiving, then, then uh, biographies, autobiographies. Uh, but the, the, the field, uh, the genre of a graphic, of the graphic novel, is the one where I see uh, the most lively debates today about what it means to, to be healthy, to be sick, to, to, um, to experience peer pressuring uh, when you are a patient, or how you manage your, your help, and um, how, how is it to be a caregiver, doctor patient encounters uh, the daily life of, of somebody who's in a chronic, uh, who has a chronic condition and the, um, the dispelling of the myths on, on certain, certain syndromes um, and certain diseases. So there's a, there, it's, it's a very rich field. I teach literature and medicine every year and we read a lot of graphic novels and uh, the debate is always very lively. Students who are mostly pre-health or pre-med have a lot to say, and that really makes them think about being a doctor in 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 a new in a new way. Because mm -hmm. so many of them come in by thinking that they would just fix and and prevent people from dying, fix the body that's not working. Instead, they start thinking uh, with me, and I start thinking with them. You know, nobody <laughs> knows uh, everything about it, so we we discuss infinitely <laughs> about. Uh, nuances and perspectives and how to tell the story of mm -hmm. illness uh, in different from different perspectives. Right, that's great. Yeah, especially the idea of perspective and telling and continuing the, the narrative and story aspect, especially in this age of auto fiction, where people draw so much from their own lives. And that can be like their upbringing, their community, um, their country of origin, whatever it is, but that also extends to um, their health condi their health conditions and their journey in that. 
So we do have uh, a question from one of the audience members that I'll read. Um, Thank you for this inter interesting discussion, Elena. I was wondering how your book can contribute to teaching courses on Russian literature slash culture. Can you share your experience of teaching a class based on your research? Yeah, so my, uh, well, this, this question comes from my chair and colleague, Ilya Vinitsky. Uh, hi, Ilya. Uh, and well, as he knows, I teach literature medicine and the course is Russian heavy in the first third of the semester, I would say. So uh, we read uh, The Death of Ivan Ilyich, we read, uh, we read Bulgakov, we read Chekhov, several stories, and the students keep going back to, to those texts. So I, I have students writing their final papers on stories we've read in the beginning. There's something existential, there's something universal about those stories that really shows how medicine is everything but uh, science i mean um, <laughs> i hope i'm hoping not to not to uh not to say something that is offensive to people but uh um, medicine is a science that's that has a good degree of interpretation of adaptation so the doctor has a human being in front of them and and has to adjust um like a theoretical abstract set of no of notions to the human being they have in front of them and um, and the perspective of the patient and makes it makes it even even more vivid. So students uh, write about Ivan Ilyich. They write about Chekhov's doctors, who show their vulnerability. Uh, so doc uh, Chekhov, as a doctor, doesn't uh, he's not um, it's not doesn't shy away from showing the doctor's vulnerability. Uh, doctors being human, so a doctor who has doubt, who makes mistakes, uh, which. Uh, strikes my students in very profound ways because they ask me sometimes why would he expose the vulnerability of the doctor when I'm a patient I want the doctor to be self-assured and somebody who takes care of me and 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 they and, and they are really struck by this and and uh, to see the humanity of the human the humaneness of doctors and their humanity too uh, as as human beings, as somebody, as people who, who have vices and 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 doubt and and all of that, so they 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 really find the sources of Russian literature uh, very productive and very um, generative in in the discussion and what they end up writing in their in their final essays. Bulgakov too, with with transplants, they get very excited about. Uh, the glands of a dog being uh, the, the the glands of a, of a thief being uh, grafted and put it uh, put into into a dog's body um, because of course we discuss um, like uh, technical devices that we host in our bodies like he hearing aids or uh, the, the cardiac defibrillator or um, hip replacements as well as you know microbiota so living beings that are inside our bodies so that this porosity of, of the human body which is a very very um a very uh i would say like well it, it, it's a topic that uh doesn't cease to to enchant us think about the gut and all the books about the gut when I mean, you worked in a bookstore i'm sure you've seen so many books mm -hmm. about the gut that in a certain year they all came out about the microbiota the gut is the second and the second brain so this idea of um organ microorganisms that live within us and actually helps us and allows us to, to 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 function so so these are all books that they read differently from the way we we read them so we know uh Ilya and i and my my colleagues harriet and 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 jacob know those books very well but it is so interesting to see them read from the perspective of a pre-med <laughs> a college student uh, who lives in this time who was born after after 9 11 at this point mm -hmm. because they don't remember what, and 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 those texts speak to them and to how they see themselves you know five ten years from now in their profession so that's very powerful mm -hmm. indeed thank you um just in closing uh i'm wondering if Elena, if you have any final thoughts or comments uh, about the book before uh, for our viewers before they pick it up for themselves, uh, perhaps uh, a closing thought. I see another 
question. Um, oh. Do I see another question? Is that yeah? Yeah, yeah. Natalia. Uh, could you comment on the relationship between medicine oh. literature and the visual? Medical narratives are often accompanied by images in various forms. What were some of the most interesting triangulations you encountered? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, hi, Natasha. I am very pleased by this question uh, because next year I'll be offering a course on medicine, literature, and the visual arts with a colleague from uh, art history. And, and that's because I've always incorporated visuals in, in my in my course and it, you know it was now time high time to <laughs> uh, that we we transition to a co-taught course and of course the visual visual aids visual materials have been part uh integral part of the constitutive part of the medical profession for centuries and thinking about anatomical atlases uh especially after the renaissance when the gaze was transferred into the body you know the map in the body as as explorers were mapping distant lands and dotting their names on, you know, the Americas, uh, they were also dotting their names on the interior of interiority of the body. You know, the, the, the interior of the year was mapped around that time. Uh, the circulation, the blood circulation was also mapped uh, around that time by Harvey, uh, the fallopian tubes, uh, the interior of the lungs. So um, there's a lot to say about, you know, going out and going in, uh, turning the gaze outward and inward, inward at the same time. So there's anatomical atlases, but then of course, photography, uh, you know, I'm thinking about Charcot and La Salpetriere, you know, the, the, the photographs of his famous hysteric, hysteric patients. And then of course, x-rays and, and, and MRIs, diagnostic, diagnostic imaging uh, and, and today, you know, gra graphic novels do. So there's there's a lot about uh, the articulation of, of, of health, illness, caregiving uh, through through the visuals and, and one cannot do without. And that's why we we visit the museum during the course. Uh, that's why I used maps in my book, uh, military maps and then uh, public health maps, but the visuals are, are are informed by by so much rhetoric that uh, contributes. You know, think about public health posters. You can comment on the lighting, on the subjects, on the race, on on the colors they wear, on their how they're they're positioned in the picture, and vis-a-vis -vis the slogan that is there. I'm thinking about AIDS in the in the HIV AIDS in the 80s or you know that there there's a lot to say about uh, visual rhetoric because of course maps are not as we know maps are not um, impartial. <laughs> well sounds like a very rich and uh, interesting class and uh, wish all the best for that it'll be a thank you. <laughs> um, any last questions from anybody who's listening? Now is the time to get them in, or any last comments on 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 the book. To thank you all for for participating in the in the discussion and for being here and talking about um, medicine and stories and bodies uh, with me, and to to the bookstore for hosting this, to my fellow panelists and all the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And uh, I can confirm, as Harriet said, it is both elegant and slender. <laughs> Thank you. And you can pick it up for 10% off from labyrinthbooks.com. Just enter Frato as the, um, as the discount code at your checkout. And uh, that is a wrap for us tonight. So thank you all very much for tuning in to this virtual event. Uh, this has been recorded, so if you want to go back and rewatch a section of this talk again or share this video with a friend, a full video will be posted to the Labyrinth Books YouTube page at a later date, probably tomorrow, something like that. So make sure that you are subscribed to Labyrinth's YouTube channel to get notified every time that a new video is posted. So thank you again, and thank you, wonderful panelists and professors, and have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Good night.